Hi there and welcome to the first club update meeting of the 22-23 season. Club day 8 is looking at listening to the voice of the player. All club update meetings for the season are available to book online at sheffieldfa.com forward slash leagues and clubs. If you have any questions or require any support from the content of this club update meeting, please contact tom.meesham at sheffieldfa.com. Crack on and I'll pick them up. Okay, cool. Um, Sorry. So, that's all right, Kaylee. no worries. You might as well use the time, definitely. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to just mention is that when we're looking at neurodiversity, one of the club dates, I believe it's the November one, is going to be around diversity as well. And we are going to also look at how to, for club committees, not just for coaches, but how club committees, welfare officers and secretaries can um, get... Um, Oh, is it? Oh, it's transcribing. That's, <laughs> and that's why it's all of a sudden come up. Right. Has, is that happening for everybody or is that just for me? Just for me. That's all right, then I'll close that because that's very distracting. Uh, yeah. So looking at how clubs can implement good strategies around um, people with neurodiversity um, who might require some slightly different types of interventional level of work. Um, so. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that Tom might have become a senior, but I haven't become a senior anything. So um, must be based on age. <laughs> anyway, um, moving on. So, yeah, so I just want to get an idea from uh, from you who are here this evening. Obviously, the reason you've come tonight is because you're interested in this as a topic um, for yourselves to be able to progress within your club, which is great. Um, so please um, either raise your hand, put something in the chat um, or shout out if, if you want to. And just think about the ideas of why is it important? This is the voice of the player. Why is it important? What does it achieve? And then how does that link to good safeguarding practices as well? Any ideas? If we tackle take Taylor's one to time. So why what what is it about the voice of the player? Having the voice of the player within your club, why is that important for your club to be able to do that? What what's the benefits? Um uh, yes, Maya. Um it just gives them like sort of a feeling of like trust, builds a relationship a bit better and lets them know that they listen to. Like I think it's one of the most simple things that a club can do. Yeah. While it feels so big to a player or an athlete or from whatever sporting background they're in. Mm. Yeah, it, it does feel like they've been truly listened to and that it is a safe place for them because they cared about. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, um, terrific. So, yeah, it does feel big, doesn't it? That's, that's a really good point as well. It feels like a big thing to do. It feels big for the player, but also feels big for the club sometimes if you're not used to doing that. Big for the coaches as well. And sometimes a bit like, oh, you know, not sure what's going to happen. So difficult. Um, but yeah, really important that, that that young people feel that they've got that mechanism to be able to talk. And the better the communication is, the more likely it is that that, that would then just become completely embedded within the way that the club operates. And then Richard, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Find out if there are any issues. Find out if there's any issues for the young people and also for, you know, for, for other people associated. But get feedback on how you're doing in terms of uh, how how's the club doing, how are the sessions. Is this actually what the young people that are there want to happen? Um, or is it have sometimes people can get a little bit um, one track, maybe or a little bit stagnant in the way that they're doing. And it's still great, but actually there could be other ideas that come forward um, if young people are empowered to speak. So it can improve those standards as well. Any other ideas? Um, hey. Just on sort of adding on to what I was saying, it sort of makes them feel in control of their own training as well at times. Lets yeah. them, yeah, it just adds to that. Yes, yeah. yeah, it helps them to be able to plan some of their own activities and to feel in control of that, which ultimately is going to lead to them being more enthusiastic about it and put more work in, which ultimately <laughs> then means you can get better results. So the whole thing can work towards just get that an improvement of standards as well. <laughs> um, and then from Laura, yeah, building the trust between the players and the managers, 
and it's that thing about the safe space which is such an important part of what we're trying to do within football and we know when it comes to safeguarding that part of the reason that abuse hasn't been challenged is because people just have not felt as though they're able to say anything um, they don't know who they could talk to they don't feel that they would be believed and there just isn't that 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 sort of practice that goes on within the um within the club so having the voice of the child there in terms of safeguarding element is really really important to be able to get the best and safest space possible um lovely stuff thank you very much for your um contributions so this is a couple of things that i sort of uh, thought about earlier i think we've covered some of them empowers the player to be able to influence their own activities exactly what Mayor said they're brilliant which leads to a better experience and then that can lead to better player retention as well so if you've got a club where people feel that they have got that uh, ability to be involved in that way they're more likely to stay at that club because they feel very much part of it um, the coach club manager um, player relationships building trust like Laura said identifying and feeling proud of their club which is always going to be good reputationally as well um, then also helping people to be able to express concerns and potentially disclose an issue should there be an issue that needs to be uh, to be talked about um, so lovely stuff um, there's different models and we're going to sort of look at this, this We've got various different models of youth voice and sometimes it does feel like to implement like a full on youth council would be a really time consuming, difficult thing to be able to do within a football club. Um, so people sometimes can get a little bit nervous about the idea of doing that and don't realise that actually an awful lot of the other stuff that they do is also voice work and is contributing towards voice work. So you could have youth structure within teams where managers are asking opinions and then capturing that. Um, I know there's one of our clubs that's um, got a parent group, possibly more than one. Um, I mean, more than one club that is a parent group that has youth representation as part of that parent group as well. So that's another conduit, a good opportunity for voice work there. Even things like surveying players to find out how they felt about certain activities um, can add to that communication strands being open and then make you think, oh, actually, you know, we've got some really good answers here let's follow that up let's see what those answers actually mean if they're if we're asking them things and we're getting the interesting responses back let's follow that up a bit more and then you might find that there is um people you know young players that actually would be quite keen to get a little bit more involved as well and you could start to feel how can we get that that additional involvement so even starting with something as simple as a survey can bring some really good responses and a, a good method of um, getting the voice work to be throughout the club. We're particularly interested in the idea of a youth committee and um, getting clubs if they've got the capacity to be able to have young people involved in their committees as well. Um, potentially not necessarily coming to every committee meeting because not all adults want to go to all committee meetings either, young people may not want to do it, but a way in which they can be involved at that more strategic level on their committees. Um, we've got them the, on the right hand side here, uh, the ladder of voice of youth voice when in my day when I was working with youth councils it was called the ladder of participation so this feels a bit more modern now but it, it looks at the way in which um, participation and voice is done and actually that sometimes it's not really of much value so these bottom three are a bit more around oh we've had to do a survey to prove that we're doing youth voice but it's not achieved anything we've asked them some questions we've actually told them what the answers to the questions are in the first place but we're now saying to everyone oh look at us we've done some youth voice work but that voice hasn't actually led to anything happening sometimes the voice survey might say yes everything is brilliant and it's like good but if you get some different responses you need to be able to allow that answer to then be part of the club as well so uh, if you can get it further up the ladder, then we can get into things like young people being consulted, actual equality between the adults and the and the young people within the club, uh, completely youth driven, um, which used to be at the top, but now has been superseded by youth adult equity, which would be, I suppose, where you'd look at a project where absolutely everybody's opinion has the complete equity with one another and all of the ideas are given the same value. Um, but also in a way that is respectful of both sides of the argument and looks at the expertise that's around. Um, I've seen completely youth driven work and sometimes it's not that successful because young people, not, none of us are experts in everything. I remember going, I was visiting a, a youth centre in 
Liverpool, which had been completely designed by young people, everything about it. The building had been designed, the spaces, the furnishings, the colours, and it just didn't work as a building. It didn't work as a space because there was no large meeting room. There was there was too many nooks and crannies which were just odd and, and you know, not functional. Um, and actually, they realised the people who, you know, they're sort of all the project people that were on that, that there needed to be more expertise in there. So actually, it would have been a better project had young people been taught how to do designing of that space, as opposed to just being allowed to, you know, come forward with their ideas and all of them were put forward. So it needs to be, projects need to be done with expertise and with equity. So, yeah, it's a bit, it's, it's, it's quite aspirational, <laughs> but uh, it's an interesting way of just looking at, um, you know, how we can try and keep it from the bottom three and make it a bit further up the ladder. Um, so just want to get some ideas here with participation. So look, thinking about that ladder. So we've got here the first one. A manager decides to ask players for their views on what they should do next session. So he gives them a choice of running around the pitch all session or doing some ball skills. Now, is that participation? Where would that be on the ladder? Any ideas? Where would that be on the ladder? We've basically got two two answers there. One of them is running around all the time and one of them is doing some ball skills. So where would that be down at the bottom or um, at the ladder or sort of further up into the middle or the top? It'll be at bottom. Yeah, be at the bottom. And why, why is that? Please. Because he's deciding, he's not asking them, he's saying, what do you want to do? Do you want to run or do you want to do ball skills? He's not asking kids what they want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah he's not said to them, um, hey, has anybody got some ideas for what we could do next session? But also he's actually given a real Hobson's choice, hasn't he? You know, you can either run around the pitch or you can do ball skills. So it's like, there's, you know, if somebody said that, they'd know that it's very unlikely that people are going to choose to run around the pitch. So it's, it's saying... Um, it's a very, very low level of participation. Though, so it's a real pretense at, um, at actually doing a, a survey. So yeah, yeah, spot on for that one. Um, so a club committee asks for, par asks for parents to give their child's opinion on what Christmas activity the club should provide. Do we, where do we think that might be in terms of participation? That's at top. We do that top. anyway. Yeah, we do it at our club, ask them what ideas they've got, what they think can make it better for them and feed off that. Yeah, I mean, it's really good. You know, I think the important bit there is to make sure that it is their child getting giving the opinion. So, yeah, if you've got a parent group that is um, strong and they're, they're, they're quite happy to bring all of those views back as well. And then the child's opinion is taken back and, and then the club actually does do the activities that the children have said. Then that is yeah that's uh, that's good level of participation there you've got the ideas um and the ideas are what is framing the actual activity so yeah um and the fact that it's been done through the parents that's that's fine you know as long as it is the child's voice that's coming through from the parents and sometimes because of the way clubs are structured it is easier to go and make contact with parents because of consent issues and all of that sort of thing as well um so club committee do a survey of their players asking what's been their favourite bit of the season. I mean, that's you're saying you pretty much do that anyway in terms of the Christmas thing. So um, that that again would be good participation as long uh, to as long as they actually going to do something with the information as well. So you could get all that information and they could say, oh, we loved this and we loved this and we loved this. And that was brilliant. And then we put it in a file, put it over there and then nobody ever looks at it again. You've done the surveying, you've, you've done the consultation, you've got the views back, but actually nothing's happened as a result. So it's making sure that that bit is the bit that happens because otherwise people say, well, what's the point in me saying anything? You know, I might say my opinion, but nobody then is doing anything with that. So it's about making sure that that opinion goes somewhere. And then sort of the last one down here could be considered to be a very good level of participation as well. Um, the club committee asks for teams, so team managers, to nominate a player in each team to help them run the summer tournament. So what you've potentially got there is young people putting themselves forward or being nominated, which presumably they'll be OK with, uh, nominating player, but then helping to run the tournament. So they could be there helping the decisions around what the cups look like, how the day is going to run, um, uh, how the communication is going to be for people. So they could have quite a lot of involvement there in something like running a tournament. 
So there is a number of things that clubs do um, where young people could be really useful and helpful in terms of having their, their voice heard there. Uh, now I'm just going to see, uh, is there any, any questions at the moment or any comments anybody would like to make? No? OK, uh, so now guest speakers. So Carly, now I we've actually we have put your slides on here or you can share them. It's up to you. Which would you prefer to do? Given that I couldn't even find my mute unmute button, I think it's going to be safer rather than try and get me to share anything. So <laughs> feel yeah, free. Okay. There's only okay. six, I think five or six. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So the board, so so Carly, yes, everybody, delighted to present to you tonight, uh, DS Carly Booth, who's going to give us uh, some slides on the voice of the child and safeguarding. So yeah, just tell me when you want the slide moving on, Carly, and I'll do that for you. Is that my first one, or is there a, the one did I send you? Yeah. Yeah, this so, is your first one. OK, so hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, for having me on here. Um, just to let you know a little bit about myself and as to why I'm a uh, police officer with uh, 20 and a bit years experience. I've been a detective for the majority of that. I've been a detective sergeant for about 18 months um, and the majority of my service has been in sort of child abuse investigation and safeguarding. I've dabbled a bit with adult safeguarding, but in the main, it's been sexual exploitation, child abuse. It's a fantastic subject to stun people with at parties when they ask what I do. Um, just a bit of a rider on this. I am not professionally qualified. I don't have degrees in anything. Um, I'm not, I, I've been trained and I've done this job for a long, long time and I've lost count of the amount of children that I've interviewed and the amount of investigations I've worked on. This is my observations from those years of training um, and my experiences really. I'm sure you could get other people with different opinions to me, but this is how I'm presenting it. So any questions, feel free to jump in. All feedback is welcome as well, because obviously what I want to be doing is giving you um, enough information so you can feel comfortable when it comes to the voice of the child. Um, it's it's about the importance of it really and ultimately it's it's what it says on the tin. Seeing that child or young person's experience from their point of view um, and the reason why this is so important, the reality of this subject is we will never eradicate child abuse ever. While ever there's human nature there will be people who want to hurt children, abuse children, or are sexually attracted to them. It's a heavy topic, but it needs to be out there because some of my service has been spent correcting the wrongs of police and partner agencies over the years who've never spoken to children. Um, and this is where it's become quite problematic. Ultimately, it's about giving the child or young person their choice. It's about giving them their opinion allowing them the kind of freedom to express their emotions, express their feelings. I appreciate this is quite heavy stuff and things that you guys deal with can range from things that quite that might seem quite fixable. It might be some kind of bullying within the team. I'm not downplaying bullying at all, but equally you could have a real massive safeguarding issue on your hands. Um, and it's about spotting the signs and knowing what to do because there's a lot of pressure on you guys, really. You could be that first disclosure. And it's about a child will be going through something that they are not in control of. Um, they have no power, no nothing. They are completely attached to their abuser. They are frightened of their abuser, whatever. And you listening to them will give them that sense of self-worth and self-esteem. Um, and it's all come from the fact that this might seem very obvious and you might be sat here thinking, well, she's not telling me anything I don't know. But years of studies have shown that we've not got this right. The police haven't got this right. We're meant to be the experts in this. Social care haven't got this right. And we're still going through that lessons learned. So this is why we're trying to get this um, this message out. Um, ultimately, it's about, you know, you can't solve every problem, but if we can react to something, if we get told something or you've got a suspicion that there's something not right with this kid, can we do enough to at least start trying to solve that problem? And ultimately, it's about seeing it from, from their side. If you can move on, please, Claire. Thank you. 
so it's about hearing the child um ultimately create a safe environment we still have it where police officers talk to the child in front of the person who may well be their abuser nothing shocks me i've seen it every day social care still do it that child needs to be able to feel safe and you will never ever ever be criticized from putting that child in a position where you're getting them away from another adult if you're not happy a lot of this is about gut feeling but create that safe environment if they want somebody there to support them allow it um but it's absolutely crucial that give them your time there's absolutely no judgment that has to come from you ultimately you don't know what that person is going to say to you and if i suddenly turn around now and said right i want everybody to talk to me about their last sexual experience which was possibly very consensual this will be a very different meeting and i think you'd all run off ultimately if we are talking about the most serious type of abuse of a child that's what you're asking them to do you're asking them to say talk to me about this horrible thing that's just happened and yes you may well be a complete sounding board for that kid you may well be someone who they think they can open up to but what you're still asking them to tell you is mortifying and no preparation can be given to you for that so it's about poker face no judgment no you're not shocking me i've been sat interviewing children before reassuring them and saying nothing you tell me will shock me and inside i've been dying because of what they're saying but it's that kid that kid's got to think actually i'm all right saying this because that adult is absolutely fine with it and i feel safe talking about it let the child use their own words use their own language kids come out with some stuff that i have no idea what they're talking about it's fine to clarify we've had referrals from various organizations where we don't know what we're dealing with because the adult was too worried to query what the kid was saying and again it sounds obvious but you won't believe the amount of times that it's it's come through to us where we're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's because nobody took the time to say to the child, what is it you mean by that? Um, but like I've put at the bottom there, it's it's more than just hearing the child. If you can move on, please, Claire. And it's about active listening. Um, and like I've put there, it's so important in terms of the voice of the child and that young person um if they think you actually give a damn and you're listening to them you can build that bond and you've got that rapport and again i've seen professionals do it where they're like glazed over thinking about what they're having for the dinner and these kids start going you're not listening to me you don't care and don't forget the amount of confidence and courage they've had to build up and this might be something that's been torturing them for however long and what we have to remember as well is and this is where i feel for you guys in this position this disclosure that they make might be the only one they ever speak about and we've had this before where we've had children with a really good bond with say a teacher or a football coach or whatever they've blurted out this horrific abuse that they've been experiencing and then completely shut down with us and we've had to try and do our best with the disclosure they've made so it's crucial that you're listening to that kid um and they, you know there's, there's professionals out there and the, active listening can be an entire session by some very very qualified psychologists and doctors and they'll talk about how the brain works and all of that i took it that a way it's a way of listening and responding to another that improves mutual understanding so when i first got trained to interview people a gazillion years ago talked about nods and googles and you think well, Bloody hell's that and it's literally what it says you sit going uh-huh uh -huh, okay and it's just that little bit that, that you know you are actually listening to me you're taking it in eye contact again it's a bit weird you might go a bit overboard and we don't want to do that but again it's just about having that engagement you actually care about what this kid's saying because this child may well have told their abuser i don't like this stop it and that adult or whoever's abusing them not listen to that so you may well be the first person to listen to them um and like i said what they say next might not be what you you're expecting i've heard kids come out with 
some unbelievable things that you wouldn't think was possible in human behavior and you have to sit there and go okay yeah like it's the most perfectly normal thing because what we don't want to do is make them think my god they're shocked with their shocked what what on earth's happening and again it seems like i'm teaching you to suck eggs and i'm really not it's just about being there in the moment and that kid being able to go oh because they might sleep that night once we've done this um like i said there's loads of analysis on active listening this is literally a, a pinprick of what there is out there but I'm obviously not qualified to teach you about all of that. But just don't jump to conclusions. Don't anticipate what they might be thinking or going to say next. Um, and, you know, you can't go far wrong with it. Um, Claire, come with what next one, please. Um, this is quite a new um, thing, believe it or not. And a child can tell you so much more by saying nothing. Um, and again, this is from experience. We've had it where children are saying certain things, but they're not making a clear disclosure, not naming somebody who's hurting them or abusing them. So we go, let's gloss it over. And there's a load of stuff coming out now. Um, the NSPCC and the Children's Society um, <laughs> have got so much literature and so much stuff on this because the behaviour is absolutely everything. Um, there's, there's a lot of work in place for babies and pre-verbal children, but I know that shouldn't affect you at all. But what you've got to think about is you see these kids really regularly and apart from school, you probably see them more regularly than other professionals. And is this kid behaving how you would normally expect them to behave? Um, there are common signs. I'll go through a few of them. Um, and it indicates that something might be happening in their life. But again, it might not be. It's not easy safeguarding and um, getting disclosures and things from children. And it's about looking and observing. And the minute we stop looking, that's when we miss things. So we're talking about changes in behaviour. Are they withdrawn? Are they anxious? Are they aggressive? Are they lacking social skills and few friends? You know, they got that poor parent bond. The, the link between a child and a parent is massive. And you might not notice it, you know, but a quick glance can tell you everything. What is that child's bond like when their parent collects them from training compared to others? And these little telltale signs, if they've got knowledge of adult issues and sexualized language that they shouldn't really know at that age, that's a massive telltale sign. Are they a problematic child? Are they missing? Um, are they covering their body? The issue you've got is all of those things that I've described pretty much describe every teenager known to man because of their behaviours. But it's about acting on your gut instincts sometimes. And if, if you've got those concerns, speak to a colleague, seek further advice. And I've always said, and I've asked some questions about children and I've been a million miles off, but I would rather be wrong than either regretful or reflective. Um, and again, you know, nobody's saying if you've got a kid who's particularly moody that day and they're normally the sunshine of the team, don't go up to them, you know, and say you're being abused. But there's ways in which you can build things and layer it um, and just, you know, if something's if you've got a hunch, it's normally right. And um, next one, please. <laughs> Um, what we need to think about here as well is your voices. Um, ask yourself, am I doing the right thing? And sometimes, again, it's very difficult if the abuser is somebody who is in a caring role or a parent or whatever. It's very easy for them to stop you from having your say. We've got cases where we know the parents are the perpetrators and they're very very compliant with organizations and with partners and with professionals um, and it's called disguised compliance and you know the, the most trained and experienced officers go oh, they seem fine parents seem fine but it's because they're in that kind of control um it's a lot of pressure for you guys and you know and it's not meant to scare you or anything like that but if you're acting in the best interest of the child, then of course 
you're doing the right mm-hmm. thing ask yourself you know do I understand this child sit down with them be available to them be honest with them you can't make promises you know and this is where people have meant well previously from organizations and said yeah you can tell me anything tell me whatever I won't tell a soul and obviously we can't do that if you've got a real safeguarding risk it's about being honest with that child and saying I, I probably I'm going to have to tell someone else but it's all about making you safe and it's all about making sure you've got that support and that your voice is heard um and whether you've done enough if you feel you've done something to support a child then yes of course you've done enough I come at this from a different angle sometimes because my job I joined the police to put nasty people in prison that's that's what I joined up to do Um, and it's not always about that it's not we're not saying you know what you've got to do is going to start off a prosecution because of course it's not but you might just do enough to be able to put some safeguarding in place is that child struggling at home is it going to reach what we call the evidential threshold to be able to take it to court probably not but do they just need that support and it's not all about horrific abuse it's not all about neglect and offences it might just be that it's a failing family or a struggling family that by you chipping in you might just change that and the most important thing which is why it's in red is always 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 tell the child they've done the right thing in speaking to you if we are dealing with a really significant harm case and you are getting told about some serious abuse by anybody a peer an acquaintance a family member whatever regardless of how you dress it up and we say we're going to put all this support around a child and we've got certain things we do these days and the police are so much better and social care are this journey that this kid's about to go on is horrendous and there'll be times when they're thinking I wish they'd not said anything but always tell them they've done the right thing that's what we say constantly throughout the whole process when we're taking them to crown court and they're watching watching their abuser go to prison excuse me it's always about telling them they've done the right thing um sorry if that was a bit of a whistle stop tour um it's very difficult because i could talk about this in certain areas all night um, and i know it's quite a heavy subject but if there's any questions feel free to ask me um, if you've got anything you want to direct by your email claire's got my contact details but i'm more than happy to assist or talk about it I'm not sure if this is what you wanted or what you expected so thank you for listening thank you carly <laughs> Claire, can I just come in for, for one minute? I know we're, we're tight for time. I just want to, I thought that was brilliant, really good insight. Um, I want to just consider kind of the implications for us as clubs and what does that all mean to us? Because at the top end of, of that, that was really important. As a culture, it is, at our clubs, it's so important that we create bonds, we listen to children about the unimportant stuff mm. and develop that relationship so that's your greetings our school what have you been up to what are you doing this weekend taking the time encouraging our coaches within our clubs if you're club officials and you're visiting training having those conversations so in that important moment when a child is looking to an adult they need to say something they've got a relationship with you you've listened and spoken to them before and then more likely to come to you. So I think the implications of 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 that are well, how do we ensure that in those moments that we've created the right environment that 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 player will reach out to one of the adults that we we trust and are in in place at our club. And I think that's when we strip it back. That's the important part for us. So what I'm gonna I will throw it back. What are you doing as clubs to make sure that your coaches and your officials are, are, are kind of developing those relationships? Because it is it is easy to players rock up for training they grab a ball off they go but are we are we taking the time to say how you doing what's school been like today or what are you doing at the weekend or oh, i saw you at the part of the day with your sister what were you doing whatever that is to just build those bonds um so that in those important moments they'll reach out to you so i think that that was really really good and, uh, and the implications as a club are what are you doing to make sure that we have that culture where like i said that's the right bottom end of listening to young people those silly conversations 
I've had I've been coaching tonight and I've had some absolute ridiculous chats with some of the lads. But in those key moments, will they reach out to me? Hopefully, because we've had those conversations previously. Sorry, Claire, Claire that was three minutes, not one. <laughs> Is there any other comments that anybody would like to make before we uh, sort of round that up? Uh, yes, yes, uh, you've got your hand up. I can't see your name there. Sorry, it's... Uh... I'm, I'm Anna. Hi, thanks so much. Oh, Anna Johnson. That was that was brilliant, Carly. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's great to hear about your experience and, and the amazing work you do. I just wanted to ask, um, in in those many years of experience, how often um, does anything come through the sort of football route or, um, you know, how often is football um, kind of involved in any of the work that you do? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I've known of one incident from a Sheffield club a long time ago um, and that was uh, it was more of uh, nothing to do with any issues within the club it was more of a, a sexual exploitation issue for one of, it was a female player um, which was she just so happened to be part of a football team thankfully and it's one of these right, <laughs> rightly or wrongly I've not had that much experience brought mm -hmm. with either concerns about adults within the footballing community or referrals that have come through um, and again it's it's one of these we could have had quite a few it's the look of the drawer I suppose bear in mind I work on one team in one department in the whole force um, and, and thankfully there isn't that many which for me is great because it means the kids haven't needed to come to you um, or whether it is that they've not been able to come to you so it's not mm -hmm massive at the minute but I, and I'm hoping that's because it's a good thing rather than they're not wanting to talk to you if that makes sense it's a difficult yeah, yeah. to answer that no that that's really helpful though I can imagine at the early part of your career probably there wasn't so much awareness in football so mm -hmm. probably things have changed quite a bit haven't they so thank you that's great Thanks. yeah um Anna just to yeah that, that's absolutely right because if you look at what's happened since um the disclosure from andy woodward and all of that kind of broke and then the fa commission the sheldon review uh they found out within that sheldon review within that three years now i'm plucking the figure slightly off the top of my head but i know it's around about 800 cases of historical abuse or, or now it's called non-recent abuse um came forward uh were discovered and, and you know investigated as part of all of that as well so that maybe because of all all of that press and all of that media attention there was there that did help to empower people to to come forward to and and hopefully again continues to mean that, that our clubs are safe spaces that the welfare officers are trained that the dbs's are in place that compliance is managed you know and all of those things that are just so important to to maintain that that standard thank you yeah OK, thank you very much, Carly. Any more comments or questions, Carly? Um, yes, Richard. Hi, yeah. um, if, if a player, because obviously I'm the welfare officer for the club, if a player approached me via phone because we've got they're where they've all got my phone number and all got mo email and things, would you recommend meeting them or would you take the phone call rather than meeting them? Hi, Richard. You all right? Hi. I know, Richard. I'm joking. It's Mrs. Do you know what? If if a kid's phoning you and they are blurting something out, take the details, to let them talk. Um, it's always as long as they're in a safe space to be able to speak. The difficulty with that is if they're on the end of the phone, you don't know where they are, you don't know what they're doing. I'd I'd urge you to find that out. But I would never, if a child in that moment wants to talk, I would never say stop. Let's give it an hour. I'll go and meet you because you don't know a lot can change in that hour do you know what I mean so if they've got a phone number and they're ringing you and they're comfortable enough to do that arrange to meet up with them after you've taken that initial disclosure and you've taken any kind of notes or whatever but obviously feel free to meet up with them and I think it, I personally think it's better to speak to people in person than on the phone but I would never ever ever tell anyone to tell a kid to stop if that's what they if that that may be the only way they can feel they can speak to you in that moment depends on each kid yeah that's fine 
No, that's and what we Richard, do. of course, you can always come to the county. You know, if you were having a situation like that and you needed some advice as well, you can come towards at the county FA um, and we can also help to try and figure out what the best me mechanism would be for that. And always here to support you. Well. Right, thank you very much. Right, we're going to um, move on then to the next slide. So we sent out a video when we sent out the meeting. Do people have the opportunity to listen to it? Um, it was from uh, from Emma at Yorkshire Sports School. Now, this was an example. The reason that we included this is because it was an example of a very quite a high level and also expensive um, project that was done around, you know, sort of a big lot of organisation in a big structure. But fundamentally, what they're looking to do there is to increase um, participation from people with more of a diverse background after after sport got hit by COVID. So actually, that is quite potentially, I thought, sort of transferable into clubs. Um, I mean, we've probably not got time to discuss it uh, uh, in the in the sort of depth that it warrants. But I know that Emma is keen to talk to people if they'll be interested in trying to take a project like that forward to, you know, to sort of a, a, a session that's specifically around that to be able to look at how that could potentially be replicated. But I just wondered if anybody had any views um, on that, you know, whether you think it could be replicated and what challenges there might be. I think it could be replicated with the with the, the Sheffield League. So all it is is getting rather than schools, you're talking about clubs. Mm, so yeah. if you got a representative from each club or a number of clubs um, that are willing to participate, it could be something that would benefit. And yeah. it also empowers the players and children because they all see each other anyway. When mm. they play each other, if they're in the similar league, they'll they'll know maybe know that player because they played them three or four times. Um, it's just kind of kind of recognition of that. But if you if you got players interested in doing it and would want to do it, and some can use it for projects like um, yeah, that's a really good point. You know, other stuff is uh, going forward. So um, yeah. yeah, it could be something very beneficial if you're doing um, Prince of uh, what's it called, Duke of Edinburgh, and things like that. Mm. Mm -hmm. You need to do something like that as part of that. So it could be something that people will take on as that as well. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I hadn't thought about the leagues, um, but actually, yeah, that's that's another element of structure that we've got available to us, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, on a very in a, a small way, what that was, was, was yeah, young people getting involved in a project to recruit other young people into sport um, and then running a big event. And it is, you know, it's a very large thing to do. But yeah, there's some... There's some possibilities with it and we're we're trying to scope out lots of different possibilities with voice work at the moment because you know we don't have a youth council at the county fa um there ha we've had discussions about whether to um to have a youth council whether to recruit to a youth council but again you know we've got the same challenges really with that that i think people in clubs do it's like well you know we'd need to have dedicated time for it Plus, we need to know what we want to achieve from it. You know, there's no point in just having a group of young people that come and meet every month. Um, and actually, we've not really got any anything we specifically want them to work on. So it, it's all it, it's all a bit of a mystery sometimes, isn't it, with uh, with how to get the best sort of voice work in. But we did think that was a very interesting project from Emma. So I'll, I'll just put a little trophy of the women's Euros down there, Tom, because I just wanted to. Um, May, as you've got your hand up. Yeah, um, I was on the committee at my running club um, oh, yeah. from being 40. Um, the aim for them, I don't know if this is helpful, um, from me was to basically just, the kids, all the kids in the group site, we all spoke to each other from, literally we had little dinky kids at like seven year old and they could see you and like, at the time I was one of the best runners for the club so they looked up to me. Mm. and they sort of used me as a voice that when maybe the kid didn't want to go and speak to like a welfare officer or a coach about something how things were going they come and said to me like oh Maya there's an issue going on or I'm not really happy with training at the moment or I'm struggling with racing can you put this forward so that was sort of how they did it with that side of things and also like arranging like kids activities and collecting like votes and stuff for that so I don't really know whether that's something that could help with in like the county FA with the committee that's 
Oh, um, somebody's leaving. Um, yeah, I think, uh, sorry, I've been calling you Mayor and it's Meyer, isn't it? I do apologise. Right. Um, <laughs> Don't worry, everyone gets their name wrong. I've just got to the point now where I accept it, whatever it is. <laughs> it sounds similar, I'm there. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you very much. Have you got um, any other questions? Yeah, so that's a, a, effect for a youth representative, isn't it, that's then able to yeah. be accessed by other young people and can feed that opinion in. And that would be great to have on a committee, you know, where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, clubs were able to get two or three representatives from throughout the club and maybe, you know, sort of, uh, you know, diverse, but also sort of a diverse age range as well, and work with them to be able to bring those views forward. Um, that that sounds like an, an excellent model, really, for within a club, um, very achievable. Um, and football clubs have got such good structure around mm -hmm. them. Um, I mean, so here I've got a, sort of a few points about how we'd set up a youth council. If you wanted to go to the sort of highest degree of so on, it would be around recruiting them. This is really important to decide where it sits in terms of who's going to be the responsible point of contact as well, because you would need somebody to be that person, that adult that is is helping to um, to to be you know to make the youth council work or youth committee or youth representatives, and it might be a volunteer that doesn't that doesn't currently have a committee role, but would be interested in in that as a, a specific um, area of work. What are they going to do? That was down to that sort of whole sort of point about what are they going to do now with with Myers um, element there was about feeding into the committee and being that voice so you, you know that those people could potentially be going around to other teams and saying is there anything you want to say but then also about activities trophies that's why I put the trophy there um, what do we want the trophies to look like isn't it by the way just a beautiful trophy as well in comparison to some of these cups and shields and things um, so, so you know, you could potentially set up an initial event and see if anybody attended. What's the structure going to be? How often do you want to meet? And then sort of what the responsibilities and further opportunities might be down the line. There's no point in people meeting just for the sake of going and having a meeting. It's like, oh, it's our youth council meeting tonight. And then everybody sits there going, right, we've had the biscuits, and we've had the hot chocolate. Now what are we going to do? And um, yeah, so it's got to be, they've got to be proper responsibilities. But when it comes to voice from speaking to a few different people, Emma and somebody else at, at South Yorkshire Sport as well, or Yorkshire Sport, don't be worried about the answers that will come back. And actually somebody from one of the clubs as well, she said this to me, they they did a survey and they had some really fascinating things came back. But initially some of the managers were a bit, oh, you know, what's going to, what's going to be said? Um, but actually when the answers came back, they were just really interesting and they were you know, all perfectly achievable and manageable. Point of contact who can help to drive the work forward. Be realistic about what's offered. Reward the participants. So if they're going to do that, that level of work, you know, give them something in return as well. And then how to achieve it, how to champion it. And the fact that that um, youth committee needs to have a visible profile within the club, within all of the club members and get the respect from uh, from managers, players, parents um, and the committee. And then what we would like to do, you know, for our benefit, we don't have a youth council, but we do want to have the voice of young people included in our service because we know that where we have the voice, we can improve the services. And the, the club data around the, um, the young female players and their periods and how to manage that, that came out of some surveys that were done with the clubs around being Euros ready. So you've got a definitive issue there that young people, young, young girls are, are struggling with. Um, and actually there's some simple things that could be put into place and we were able to be the conduit for that training. So if we know that there's an issue, we can try and divert some either funding or time towards something like that as well. But we need to know what the, uh, you know, where we need to focus the work. So that could give us insights into projects that we're running. We've got leadership and ambassador projects. If people have got a voice structure in a club, we can help to feed into that with the leadership um, opportunities that are there as well from the FA. Also, something I'm quite keen to do is to get a focus group together to look at our website, particularly the youth zone of our website, which was written by me, who is not exactly in the first flush of youth. You'll be surprised to hear. Um, so it would be great to actually have a, a group of young people to look through the website and go, nah, what have you done? This is rubbish. Or to go, actually, that bit's all right, but that bit isn't. And you should have something like that. So we'll be really interested in being able to link up with people on that. And we want to support you and develop some good resources as well to help drive it forward. So, you know, maybe some uh, templates for different models that could be done, some surveys uh, just at sort of starting point um, and promote good voice models works in the clubs. And I think that might be the end of my slides, but I just want to mention them. 
there potentially is going to be a silent sidelines thing coming from the FA for October. And I think that could be an ideal voice opportunity there for, for us and for yourselves as well, where if we can survey people and talk to them after the silent sidelines, talk to young referees, young players, parents, managers, and just get a really good idea of how people have felt about it and then be able to sort of collate that information and, and then with that information base some work moving forward as well. So that's uh, something to look out for when it comes from the FA. That's uh, yeah, so I'm going to pass back over to Tom, but is there any other comments or questions that um, anybody would like to make? Well, thank you very much for listening. And I do want to, we want to keep trying and keep this momentum up. Thank you very much to Carly as well. We want to, to really sort of try and keep the momentum of voice work up. And if you've got ideas or you've got things that you're doing, please let me know about it. And if, or if there's something that I could come um, and sit in on a meeting that you're doing with young people, or you, you've got some ideas about how you'd like to drive it forward. Uh, yeah, please get in touch with me or get in touch with Tom and we'll, we'll do everything that we can to help to, to support that to be a great piece of work. Right, thank you very much. And over to you, Dom. Well, I'm back on my laptop now, so I can I can do the clicking as well. We're all good. Oh. OK, so I'm not going to keep because we we really keen to try. It's my fault today because the Internet broke, but we're really keen to try and keep these to an hour um, to hopefully ensure that people keep coming back um, rather than getting kept on for an hour and a half, two hours. So just a quick uh, catch up on, on what's coming up. Um, so all of our club update meetings for this season are, are online. So I, we'll send you this slide deck tomorrow morning. If you click that link or if you just go to the website and go clubs and club update meetings, they're all sat on there, all the topics and what they're about. So you can pick and choose which one you attend or just come to them all, whichever, whichever works for you. But there, in again, you might have different people within your club that you think, I want that person on that call, or I want this person on that call because it links their role within the club. So we've got the whole season planned out. Um, so our next one is around creating a positive environment. Feel free to send your coaches on that as well as club officials, but we'll be looking at that club, um, that club role in ensuring that the environment created for your players is the right one and we'll also be touching on respect and discipline and things like that to give you an insight into those areas so it should be good and then the one after that will be around accreditation and revalidation which i think will be quite an important one for us to cover so they're all up and online and you can sign up right now for any of the events coming up like i said don't worry about copying the link now i'll be able i'll send the slide deck out and you'll be able to click it um next up we've got a couple of coach support offers so if you weren't aware we as the county fa do coach support so it's cpd in old terms it's coach education in short anything but courses we deliver because england football deliver the courses so we've got two big events coming up so for you clubs that are either in the sheffield and district junior league or the doncaster and district junior league we've got a couple of coach conferences coming up they're available to book online through that link but we'd be keen for you to share that information and, uh, and send it out to your coaches and encourage them to come on all of our coach support is free of charge when you click on that link as well, there's three other events that are up and running, and that's where our diversity, uh, sorry, neurodiversity and the how to support players during their period workshops when they go back on. That is where they will live. So it's worth circulating that link with your coaches at your club because it, it's free coach ed. Uh, the football specific stuff, they always get a, a pack sent out. So they get support, they get session plans, they get to watch the practical and they get the face to face element. So we keep them free of charge, which I keep saying, but we're really keen to get as many coaches down to those events um, for the benefit of your players in short. So uh, for me, in my role, it's so important that our clubs buy into that and really push for as many of your coaches to come on to them. So again, the link will be live when we send the slide deck out. Oh, I've clicked two. And in the last one, just another important one linked back to the very first slide about last night is the Wildcats and the squad application windows are open. And as you can see from Chris's uh, tagline, you'd be wild to miss out on that. So for you as clubs, if you don't already already have women or girls teams in particular, these are a great way to kickstart that program. Absolutely, the Wildcats program has been unbelievably important in our county for, for the growth of, of girls teams. The Women and Girls League setting up their under eights last year. We've got the Doncaster and District Junior League setting up uh, girls leagues at seven, eights, nines and tens this year. So if you're not already uh, involved in that, it is something to look at. My colleague Molly would love to hear from you. So please do get in touch with her um, if that is something that your club are looking into. So Wildcats is for your five to 11s. And Squad is a new product, um, a new initiative for those teenage girls. And what we're hoping for 
is that maybe those girls that aren't in a team or have maybe played some football at school and, and dipped the toe in and think, I don't mind this, or been inspired from, from last night and the last four weeks, that they are given somewhere where they can go and play that's not necessarily in teams, but might develop into that. So it's a it's a rec session, but it's the opportunity to go out there and join teams from there. So two really great programmes and initiatives that if you want any support, any help, any guidance, speak to Molly. Um, you'll be pleased to know that both of those pr uh, programmes do have funding, do have equipment packs, and Molly will support you every step of the way. So please do engage with those if you can, or if it's something that you're looking to uh, get involved in. And then last of all, I think we've done well there, 11 minutes over after a rough start. If you've got any questions at all, me and Claire will stay on until everyone clears out. So if you want to have that private one and wait for everyone to go, you can do that or fire at the chat, stick your hand up, unmute yourself. Now's your time. But before we do that, just a final thank you from myself, from Claire. Massive thank you to Carly for coming on and sharing her experiences and giving us a different insight, which is really important and really valuable for you, for you as club officials. Um, and hopefully you'll join us for the next ones. We'll hopefully keep running them like this. So we'll get the celebrity guest speakers in to give it a bit of extra, extra value. Um, but we hope it's been worthwhile jumping on tonight and we hope to see you at the next one. Um, I will send the slide deck and we will send the recording out to you tomorrow. Thank you so, very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording just if we do oh, get any yeah. questions.